am Justine Bethel, and uh, the name of my piece is For the Love of Guts, a Vegetarian Perspective on Taxidermy. <laughs> I'd always assumed my first love would be a human, or at least alive. <laughs> my first love was a juvenile red mask conure with a broken wing, found dead side on the road. It was beautiful, clean, gone before its time. I could hear the smallest violin in the world playing a sad song for this little naturalized parrot. I loved the cuddly, human-like personalities of mammals, but I was fascinated by the descendants of dinosaurs, the birds. My mother was a strict vegan. I didn't realize that people ate animals as a child or that the pinkish brown, slimy looking sheets between my friend's Wonder Bread had once been a living being. Animals were beloved companions, wild creatures, or tamed ambassadors that teach us to recycle, or that only you can prevent forest fires. Animals reminded me that we too were once wild creatures, roaming the land in search of food and shelter. As I grew older, I realized the disconnect that existed when people consumed meat without considering its origin. Once upon a time, that protein-rich meal or fur coat was a living thing. I felt pain for those animals. I understood why people are uncomfortable to butcher their own food. It is gross to see the insides or to imagine that that food had had a personality, a face. It's a kind of sentimentality which makes us grow fond of many domesticated creatures. I was grossed out by guts too, but I was curious about how they worked in unison and in private. As a middle school student, my animal activist mother never wanted me to participate in biology. I had been switched out of a few classes already. She viewed the killing of animals for science as cruel and wanted me to have no part of that process. My mother was a stern believer of animal freedom and had participated in lab animal releases with PETA. Since it was mandatory for my school, we were shown a video of a pig dissection. Blood, organs, all the internal working parts of a living being were being cut and dissected before our very eyes. I thought it was interesting, but also repulsive. I found it funny that these same students, just as disgusted, would be eating ham sandwiches later. How could they not see the connection? An animal is an animal is an animal. And that sandwich was once breathing. <laughs> it was right around that time that I tried dairy products, and yogurt was the most amazing thing that ever happened to my mouth. <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> it took a while to warm up to eggs, and I didn't try them until my early 20s. I was taken out of the next biology class by my mom because it was an elective. It was the year we learned about anatomy. I drew a pretty good illustration of a frog dissection without having to kill one. As word got around my <laughs> as word got around the middle school, my friends became aware of my fascination with biology. A friend of a friend at school brought me a cow's eyeball, illegally smuggled from biology lab, still partly frozen and stinky. Quite frankly, it was nasty. I guess he thought I'd like it because it was anatomy related, but it wasn't what I had in mind. He probably had a crush on me. But even for a girl like me, a cow's eye isn't really a great gift. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really want it, but because he put his middle school career on the line to do this for me, I reluctantly put the little plastic baggie in my lunchbox. I reached adolescence and found myself sketching organ systems, bones, and feather drawings in classes that had nothing to do with anatomy. I wanted to take biology again, but my high school did not offer it. I figured I probably didn't have the stomach anyway. I was slowly distracted from my curiosities, focusing on getting my diploma and working a night job. I was saving up money I made selling paintings and living life. Years passed and I became an adult. That's what it's like when you become an adult. Um, 
I, I had just gotten my first apartment, and I began studying bird feathers and coloration. I started a company making jewelry and art using naturally shed exotic feathers, keeping true to my roots. I was able to make a living working with bird rescues for feather drops, and my passion grew as my business grew. I named my company Friendly Feathers. That's www.friendlyfeathershop.com for from shameless self-promotion there. <laughs> Emphasizing cruelty-free and educational plumage. <laughs> and that's when it, I got weird again. I got a frantic call from a friend one afternoon. He was biking over to my house and saw a parrot on the side of the road, <laughs> a block near my place. On further inspection, the poor little creature was dead. Luckily, a plastic bag on hand, he was able to scoop up the lifeless bird and bring it to me. He thought I might want to use the feathers. When he brought it back, that was when I met my first love, a juvenile red mass conure gone before its time. Its bright green feathers were ideal camouflage for hanging out in trees, and its little beak was just adorable, tan-colored with a splash of red feathers on top. Its little black feet with two toes facing its way had amazingly sharp claws. Its feathers were filthy, dusted with oily dirt, the result of living in the city. This bird found its way to me for a reason. I felt connected to this creature, just as I had felt connected to every animal I came into contact with, regardless of whether it was alive or not. I realized my love for innocent creatures stemmed from a desire to protect them, and there is nothing left to fear after you die. Natural death becomes a passion because preserving every creature I found was a way to keep them safe and a way for them to live forever. Instead of consuming them, I wanted to have a piece of them that will be cherished forever. Memento mori, a phrase that means remember you're dead. I wanted creatures that passed unintentionally to be given a second chance. It would be a way for them to be cherished far beyond their years. After careful research, I found that I probably would not catch a disease from this bird. Despite scientific evidence, my grouchiest, not on the lease roommate's girlfriend wanted it out. He loved it, probably because it bothered her so much. She said, it's disgusting, get it out of the freezer. Meanwhile, <laughs> my roommate, her boyfriend, said, but honey, it's not any different than the chicken we have in there. I could cook it up for dinner instead, and you wouldn't know the difference. Now, completely horrified and paranoid, she stormed off to her room. Even after the project was done, regardless of my cleaning efforts, she scrubbed the whole kitchen down with bleach. She was not pleased with a parrot carcass touching her peas. I clipped its little wings trimmed off the tail feathers and sanitized along the way. Each part was snipped carefully as incense burned and music played. After finishing my project, I placed the little bird's parts in their resting place for the next two months. I closed the box and wrote, do not open until this date. It went in the back of a dark, dry, unused cupboard, like a feathered mummy waiting to be discovered in a cardboard pyramid. Deciding against a full dissection, I buried the remains with a ceremony, complete with the playing of Free Bird by Leonard Skinner as we <laughs> lowered the coffin into the ground. Two people and a cat attended. <laughs> Tears were shed for the little parrot that did not make it. I adored that little green bird as if I had known it in its life. Its flock lived so close to my home, I felt I might have seen the bird fly past my third story window before its death. Then, about four months after the funeral, I dug it up. The bones were soaking in groundwater, so I had to delicately sift them. I soaked them in peroxide to clean and whiten them. It foamed like a bubble bath. One more day of drying bones, and by then I had a few decent pieces of partial taxidermy. I had wings, bones, a tail, and tiny feet. I planned appropriate items for each piece such as a tail fan for prayer or ceremonies, a wing hair clip, parrot foot earrings, <laughs> and pieces of an exotic bird skeleton. These items I intended to last much longer than the original owner, the parrot, and hopefully would outlive me too. I showed the finished pieces to my roommate's girlfriend, 
who was against the process the whole time. To my surprise, she touched the wings and was impressed that I could make something pretty out of a dead animal. They found their way into a private museum in the hands of a collector that appreciated and cared for this adolescent bird as much as I did. When I collected my check, I realized that this sort of art was profitable and I began to seek out new specimens. It was now just a question of getting creatures that were not hunted and were not killed for my purposes. The world of natural death taxidermy is part luck and part of it relies on good <laughs> connections. It's on the fringes of legality and one must always be aware of disease, parasites, and other fun things that come with dealing in animal parts. It's generally not something animal activists and vegetarians should do or would do. Whenever I decide to show a few pieces in my cruelty-free craft booth, it always shocks, disgusts, and amazes people. Little feet in jars are more popular than you think. And when you know it died without intentional cruelty, it's that much easier to enjoy. Thank you.